Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In a previous episode, we took a look at an MNL100 nitrogen laser that had apparently come out of a dumpster, and we actually managed to get some life out of it. In this episode, we're going to look at how I rebuilt the thing, and we're even going to overclock it as well. So let's go. So this is a follow-up video to the MNL100 uh, dumpster laser teardown. Um, this particular laser had uh, a broken control board, um, which I've stripped out. Uh, and towards the end of the last video there, I'd replaced the solid state switch um, with a, a homemade spark gap and the laser actually ran. Um, so I'd said towards the end of the last video that if we could get hold of um, a commercial um, a triggered spark gap, such as in this uh, old LSI nurtured and laser, um, that we could substitute that in for the spark gap, build our own control electronics, and maybe build something that was, you know, a, a useful piece of kit to have in the home lab. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So this is my rebuilt MNL100 nitrogen laser. Um, as you can see, I've stripped all of the original uh, scuffed paintwork off the thing and given it a nice coat of uh, satin black, uh, which I think is much more appropriate for, uh, for my lab. Um, I've plugged up some of the unused uh, connectors up at the back there. Um, I suppose what we're really interested in is seeing this work, but before we do that, let's go and see the modifications that I've made to this thing. So in order to run the nitrogen laser correctly, we need some uh, control electronics. This is uh, pretty basic, um, but it's pretty interesting how the thing works. On the left-hand side here, I've got a high voltage supply, and this supply is the trigger transformer, which is mounted up the front of the case, and we'll see that shortly. Um, so this produces, you know, maybe 460 volts or so that's uh, run through the, the little hole in the bottom there. Uh, the rest of the control electronics is designed to accept an optical signal in so that I can run it from the function generator without back EMF doing anything weird to it. Um, so I've actually removed the original um, fiber optic uh, receiver off of the control board and soldered that on here. Um, this drives a, a little circuit which splits off the signal into two parts. Um, one of them is directed back down onto the pre-ionization board uh, to provide a pre-pulse to make sure that the tube has been sufficiently ionized in order to fire at low repetition rates. And the other pulse goes all the way to the front uh, where I've got a trigger board um, that does the magic and fires off the uh, triggered spark gap. Um, it's fairly compact and when I was sort of putting this thing together it was it was kind of a pain in the backside to shoehorn everything in there uh, but it seems to have fit in really quite well. Let's take a look at the circuit diagram for this real quick and then we'll take the cover off and take a look at the rest of the stuff. So here's a circuit diagram of the, uh, the, the new control electronics that I've put in the laser head there. On the left, we've got the original 2524Z fiber optic receiver, um, and it's passed into a 2N3906 that's configured as an inverter. When the signal comes in, um, we've got 100 microsecond light pulse that we, we pick up here for, to trigger the laser, right? Um, and that pulse um, output from this uh, particular device is inverted, so we want to invert that again so it becomes a positive going pulse um, to send off to our trigger board. Um, there's a little filter um, that goes off towards the trigger board. The trigger board is mounted in the front of the head and it's a long twisted pair of wires uh, that runs right by um, electronics which are emitting RF um, every time the thing fires. So I've got uh, an ultra-fast uh, UF4007 there um, just to stop any, anything going backwards um, into my circuit and I've got a 470 picofarad capacitor um, just to suppress any noise that's coming back down. You know, the, the wires to the trigger board essentially act like a, a, an 8 inch long aerial uh, and that's pretty bad for the control electronics. Um, also, we need, uh, we need to do something about pre-ionization. So the pre-ionizer in the, in the laser is free running at 30 hertz, as we saw last time. And what we need to do is to provide a pre-ionization pulse that occurs just before um, the trigger pulse um, that, that we've sent off to the, uh, to the trigger board. Um, so what I've got down at the bottom is this little circuit. Um, it's an IC differentiator, uh, so we've got a, a square wave signal coming in with a width of, say, um, 100 microseconds or so. Uh, so up until this point it's nice and square. By the time it passes through the differentiator we've got a signal that looks like this, um, which you know is sort of a, a very fast spike. Um, and then we just square that off with a couple of Schmidt trigger inverters. Um, so we end up with a very, very nice short 200 nanoseconds pulse, um, which is what we need to be providing for the pre-ionization board. Um, so at, at low repetition rates, we've got a little switch here that's on the side of the case. I've uh, got a little switch, so at low repetition rate between like 1 and 15 hertz, we would leave this running. And then if we go above that, you know, 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 30 hertz, we just turn that off. 
Um, trigger board itself is really quite straightforward. So we've got a trigger out up here, um, and this runs into a Mach 3020, which is a, a, an Optal Triac. Um, and then this triggers a TIC 106D um, thyristor or a silicon control rectifier if you prefer. And this dumps the charge from this 47 microfarad capacitor into a trigger transformer, which produces, you know, maybe 10 or 15,000 volts, which is enough to trigger uh, the main spark gap. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, it's currently limited with a 0.3 mega ohm resistor. And we've got a little neon light across there so that, you know, I can see whether or not there's voltage present on the board. Uh, but that's the control electronics in a nutshell. The signal from the pre-ionizer uh, goes onto the main pre-ionizer board and on that board is a TC247 CPA um, high-speed MOSFET controller. Um, this is actually fed with a, a 30 hertz 200 nanosecond width signal from somewhere on the board uh, but it goes through a voltage divider and so we're just going to inject um, our pre-ionization signal um, right in the middle of the voltage divider there and that's enough to fire um, the main transistor which fires the tube. Uh, and gives us our pre-ionization pulse. Um, let's take a look at um, the trigger board itself and where we've wired this thing to in the nitrogen laser. So I've got the cover off the nitrogen laser here. Uh, we see a little piece of coax going off to the voltage divider uh, just before the MOSFET driver. So that's where we sort of uh, couple our signal into. Um, that's all there is to it. There's nothing more exciting. I could have done something a little bit more complicated with this, like maybe turn off the, uh, the original uh, 30 hertz repetition. But um, honestly, a switch will do just fine. Uh, why complicate things? Um, over here, we've got the trigger board itself. So we can see our very large capacitor there. Um, and the idea is that when we um, provide this with a signal, this large capacitor uh, dumps all of its energy through this uh, little Perkin Elmer trigger transformer, um, which is passed off to the trigger pin on this triggered spark gap. Um, spark gap itself I had to do a little bit of cutting and uh, filing to get everything in there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's coupled to ground by means of a, a, a nice wide brass strap. Um, to give us a low inductance path and make sure that this charge is as fast as we can get it. And if I just move things around a bit, um, we can see how I've mounted the um, spark gap on top there. So I've just coupled it in with a piece of aluminium rail. Um, obviously, um, all of this assembly is at about 12,500 volts. Um, so we need to take care with insulation um, to make sure that the spark gap doesn't arc across to the uh, electronics here. I've just put a, a, a lump of silicone hose um, to shield the, uh, shield the wires that go in for the fans there. And then before I button the case up, um, the original plastics will all be pulled over the top to prevent it from arcing onto the case. Um, what we really want to see is this thing working, right? So let's put the cover back on, we'll connect it up to a function generator and we'll give it a go. So I have the nitrogen laser all set up here. I've got a little fluorescent target in front, which is just a piece of white paper. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, I'm actually using fiber optics to trigger this. Um, so I've got a little piece of fiber optic here and you can see a little light flashing in there. Uh, that's our signal. Um, it's 100 microseconds long for every pulse and it's currently pulsing at about 5 hertz. Um, so we'll plug that in. We will power on the laser. And there we've got our output. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I can go over to the function generator here and turn up the repetition rate. So now we're at about 15 hertz or thereabouts. Um, once we get to about 15 hertz, we can actually turn off um, the pre-pulse because the 30 hertz pre-ionization pulse that's running on the on the original board is good enough to keep the thing alive anyway. Um, best thing about this particular laser is uh, now that I've got my own control electronics in there we can push this to its absolute limit. So currently um, it's running at about 16 hertz um, but we can drive it up to um, 36 hertz which is a little over the manufacturer's spec. Um, we can keep going. Um, now I'm at 66 hertz and now we're running at an incredible 96 hertz, so 96 pulses per second out of this thing. Absolutely fantastic. Um, this, of course, drives up the average output power, um, which is you know, pretty decent as well. Um, this is gonna be fantastic for driving things like dye lasers at a really, really decent repetition rate. Um, obviously, I probably won't want to run it at like 96 hertz for very, very long, but it, the, tube, the tube and the control electronics are certainly uh, more than capable of doing so, um, which is absolutely fantastic. Let's rearrange stuff on the bench here and pump a dye laser with it. Um, I'd like to see what happens there.
So I have the dye laser set up in front of the nitrogen laser and we're pumping it at about one hertz. Um, if I hold a piece of card in front of the dye laser, um, we can see the brilliant yellow flash from the Rhodamine 6G. Fantastic. Um, let's crank up the wick on this thing and see how hard we can push it. So we're running at about 10 hertz now, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, let's turn off the pre-ionizer because we don't need it anymore. So there's our pre-pulses gone. Um, we'll crank it up a little bit more. Um, so now we're at uh, 20 hertz. I think that'll beat with the camera in some inexplicable way, but we'll keep going. Um, now we're at 30 hertz, 40 hertz, 50 hertz, 60 hertz, 70 hertz, 80 hertz, and then finally 90 hertz. Check that out. That is incredibly bright, by the way. Uh, this dye laser must be putting out average power in the order of, you know, several milliwatts at least of uh, pure brilliant yellow light. Absolutely amazing. Let's blow some smoke in the beam and take a look, see what that looks like. So I've just wafted a bit of magic can into the room. Uh, we're currently running at 11 hertz. Uh, let's crank it back up again. That is absolutely superb. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, we can see there's a, there's a beam being reflected off the diffraction grating there, but there's our main beam. Um, it almost looks continuous to the eye. Really, really beautiful. Absolutely fantastic for sure. Now this must be putting out you know several milliwatts easily. Um, I've noticed that with the uh, with the tuning knob at the back there, I can't actually tune the output. So I suspect I'm driving it uh, too hard um, in terms of output power. Um, not necessarily repetition rate, but uh, yeah, fantastic. Let's uh, let's measure the output power of this thing. I'm, I'm curious to see in what sort of condition the tube is in the nitrogen laser. So I've just done a quick setup here. Uh, in front of the nitrogen laser, I've just mounted a lens, uh, and then behind the lens, I've mounted my um, joule meter. Uh, so, so this is an ED100A that I picked up uh, some time ago. I actually picked up a pair of these um, to run some comparisons to make sure that uh, these things agreed with each other. Um, so this outputs 134.3 volts per joule, but if you've seen my other video, uh, really uh, this is designed for measuring microjoules and millijoules, so in actuality um, it's not likely that you'll see any more than you know a few uh, tens of millivolts out. Um, but I've got this thing hooked up, um, I've hooked it up to the oscilloscope, um, let's take a look at the, uh, the output from the energy meter uh, and then we'll take a look at some calculations. So here's the output of the uh, energy sensor on the oscilloscope and we can see that we're measuring uh, 20 millivolts out um, from ground to peak. Um, and so we can take that figure and the original calibration figure of 134.3 volts per joule uh, and actually work out what the output power of the laser is. Um, I actually put together a handy little JavaScript calculator to do that. Um, so let's go and take a look at that just now. So here's my little JavaScript calculator. Um, we've got a couple of fields here. We can input the uh, sensitivity of the sensor in volts per joule. Um, as I've said, this one is actually 134.3. Um, so there it is. Uh, we can put in our peak voltage in millivolts. Um, so we read 20 millivolts there. Uh, we've got our laser pulse width in nanoseconds. Um, I think it's about 2.4 or thereabouts. And then we've got our repetition rate, um, which can go as high as like 99 Hertz. And then we can hit calculate and see what all of our um, relative powers are. Uh, the actual output power is 148.92 microjoules, so 149 microjoules per shot, uh, which means that the tube itself is in excellent condition. Um, normally these tubes are rated to at least put out 140 microjoules after let's say a million shots or so, um, so really, really good. Um, our peak power is 62 odd kilowatts, which seems about right. And our average power at 99 Hertz is almost 15 milliwatts. Um, so absolutely fantastic. So because everyone loves laser beams, we'll try some different dyes in the dye laser. Um, I've got Kumar in one in the dye laser just now, so we'll turn up the wick on this thing and blow some smoke at it. Beautiful. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, let's try another one. This time I've got Rhodamine B in the Covet, which produces a, a really brilliant red beam. Fantastic. And then finally we have our old favorite Rhodamine 6G, which lasers in the sort of green, orange, yellow um, range of the visible spectrum, uh, which is the most efficient dye that I actually have. And it's a very, very brilliant yellow color. Absolutely fantastic. 
Thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.